Man, I am excited today. I'm fired up, Chris. We got Chris Tossi, our co-CEO, on the show today, which is absolutely thrilling. He's a crazy guy, got a lot of knowledge. But, man, it's all about our special guest today, 1985 Chicago Bears Super Bowl champion, wide receiver, best blocking wide receiver in the land, over the middle, slot wide receiver in motion, block for Walter Payton. But it's not just about his football career. It's about what he's doing in life now because he's doing a lot. He's been up to a lot. Want to introduce to you today, Mr. Dennis McKinnon. Thank you for joining us in the club, powered by Club Colors. Uh, so happy to be in the house. Dennis, it's a, it's brilliant. It's absolutely uh a joy to have you here. I had a chance to kind of go on a tour with you and take you around. And I got to tell you, man, you light up a room. You light up a room. Chocolate does that, man. <laughs> that's that's going to leave my first question. How in the world does one get the nickname Silky D? Um, Ted Plum, who was my ride with Super Coach back in the day, um, said that he runs well. He runs routes well. He looks smooth doing it, so he called me Silky. Okay. No one knew my nickname until Johnny Morris at one post-game interview. They put a tagline, my, my nickname, underneath my name. And that's where the legend was born. So Johnny Morris and Mr. Plum yep. got, got you the nickname Silky D. Yeah. Living up to that had to be a little bit interesting. No, I'm Silky and I'm still sweet. You got the dance moves? Oh, man, come on. I watched you a score I got soul training in my feet. <laughs> Well, we saw some of that. We saw some of those dance moves as you were walking through the building. I'm, I'm curious, what are you up to now? Like, what, what, what's going on in business now? Talk about your little bit of your personal brand. What are you working on it these days? Well, I mean, obviously, if you if you're healthy, that's the most important thing. Mm-hmm. So I changed my diet, made sure I didn't gain any weight, sitting at home doing COVID, you know, and had to remarket, rebrand based on almost all my contacts and relationships. Kind of were in, and we call it impasse. Mm-hmm. All the brick and mortars were closed. Nobody was doing personal appearance, no motivational speaking. Tough to do events. You know, I, I couldn't do golf odds. I couldn't coach a little league, nothing. And I had just become an author. just had my book out. So I had to figure out a way to do something I was never really comfortable with online. So I had to start trusting an entity that I was not really familiar with. But I've always had great relationship with my military, having a brother who served in the Army for 32 years. So all our branches, I'm really supportive of, but it, there are Bear fans all around the world. So that was the best way of promoting the book. I'm a life coach on my own, but the young men who are incarcerated here in Chicago, so I'm a mentor. So I speak to kids who are incarcerated. I support battered women. I've dealt with women who dealt with suicide, uh, addiction. So you name it, I'm kind of got my foot in the door just about everywhere. Yeah, uh, I've been an ambassador for the state of Illinois for almost 35 years. So I stay busy. Even though I'm retired, retired on paper, but I'm always working. I always wonder, like from a personal brand standpoint, NFL players, former champions in, in Major League Baseball, whatever it might be, that's your identity, right? Yeah. Does it ever get annoying that, like, for instance, I walked you around the building, I introduced you to people and it's 1985 Chicago Bears Super Bowl champion. Does that ever get old? Do you ever get to the point where you think to yourself, man, I wish they would say, you know, Dennis McKinnon. CEO, media personality, uh, charity uh, advocate. Does that ever get old or, or is there a good balance there? There's a balance there because at the end of the day, as long as you get in the door and get a seat at the table, then you can tell about you. Yeah. You don't get to know me unless you get to talk to me. So what you find on Google or what's part of my tagline, that's most all people know because I haven't let you inside my space. Mm-hmm. Now, if you sit and talk, we can delve into so many things that people don't even know because certain things are private and they stay private. And I come from a generation where there was no internet, no social media. So if I talk to you, what we talked about was between us. No one else knew about it. Mm-hmm. And I was, I've never been, even to this day, about trying to be popular, trying to get likes, trying to get followers. I really don't care. Everybody who I talk to on my social media pages, I have their phone number. Yeah. I talk to them. I know them personally as opposed to having a following that always got their hand out. Not into that. Dennis, I have a question. Obviously, you're involved in a lot of things, but things normally happen as a result of a principle or a purpose or an overarching theme that is important to you. So why all the different causes and what is central to, what is core to you that allows you to be relevant and impactful in all those different types of situations? Because there's a lot of people that are scattered 
right? That they want to get involved. It doesn't sound like you want to get involved. You get involved. That takes a different level of commitment. What drives that internally for you? I think two things. One, having great parents, blue collar. Between mom and dad, mom was a school bus driver for 35 years. Dad was a foreman. Between them, they might have made $20,000. They raised three boys. Three boys who've never been in trouble, never been arrested. I'm a graduate, Florida State, criminology. My younger brother works for FedEx, and my brother served in the Army 32 years. And when I talked to my daddy, he said, you never caused me one night of sleep in 60 years. The greatest compliment you can give to a son or to a daughter. So that's pride that's tied to that. Athletes um, have a tendency to always say, well, someone pushed him through, took care of him, looked the other way, always protected him. Everything that I've ever gotten, I've earned on my own. I've been on my own since I was 17. Never asked my dad for a dime. Still haven't asked him for a dime. And I'm proud of that. But more importantly, I think, on a personal side, mom and dad divorced when I was 16. I found out then about domestic abuse. I've always been a champion looking out for women. My best friends are female. I've always been a protector. And from that standpoint, women who believe they can't get out, yes, you can. You just got to talk to the right people. If you tell your girlfriend you've been abused and she doesn't get you to help, she's not a real girlfriend. Every girl has a brother or a dad or an uncle that will intervene when necessary. So don't lower your bar for anybody. You're God's child, which means you're special. Yep. I think in so many ways too, I think that the principles that you're espousing and and talking about, I think those are some of the, the core fundamental things that this new generation, some of them have and don't have. And again, back to your earlier comment, I don't know if, if this is before we got live, but social media, I think, plays a part in some of that. I grew up in an era where social media was available, but it wasn't fundamental to my family. My mom and dad were very hardworking immigrants. I was born in another country. And it was always five o'clock, we had dinner. Nothing was more important than being home. And you talked about the day. It wasn't just a recap. It was, it was almost like an interrogation. But I think what they were figuring out is were there outside influences changing yep. the core structure of where I was supposed to be? I missed two days in my entire grammar school, high school, college, different story, but that, that was a that little bit of a That might be that Eastern thing. European thing, man, because my, my mom was German. It was like I could have a broken leg that was the bone was poking out. She's like, take a shower. You'll be good. Exactly. But I, I think in a lot of ways, too, and, and as things develop in somebody's life experience, having some of those principles and some of that predictability about decision-making, how you make decision. It's one of the things that I found interesting. I've worked with a lot of folks in the business for a little while. I'm in a season of my life and in my career where the most value I could bring to this organization is to help people think about how they think about their situations and to provide a little perspective of, you know, you may think you're in the, in the storm, but on the other side of that storm with 30 seconds of courage, you could be in calm water again, but it's when you're in it, it's very hard to see that, to how to get out of that. And You have to have incredible faith. Faith gives you strength, makes you do things you don't think you really have the power to do. It allows you not to disbelieve and be able to see things for what they actually are, knowing that you always have help. Mm-hmm. Can't do anything in this world on your own anyway. No. You know, and the success that we have, you didn't get there by yourself. Somebody helped you. Someone got it, someone looked out for you. And I think success allows you not to be selfish. You got to be able to share. And um, and I think as a guy, we have a tendency to be bravado about everything, but we have a sensitive side. We try not to let out of the bag because we don't want to be considered not strong. I feel pain. Pain hurts. Pain will bring you to tears. You know, so with that, it's a human emotions that we should always express even when we're the most vulnerable. I think in a lot of ways to think one of the things that has been lost in this world is the ability to show emotion, and not be judged for it. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've broken down in front of my teammates, my family. And I find a lot of strength in sharing emotion because then I'm more relatable. And guess what happens when you're relatable? You find out there's a lot more people that are in the same situation as you, having the same doubts as you, having the same fears as you. And you create a community of people that, now you can bet on together instead of you think you're a, you're a one person show and you've got to figure it all out because well, that's all you got. You can't have true connection unless you're authentic, right? And that's what I think you're talking about with social media. There's yeah. two different things on social media, right? One's a persona 
and one's a personal brand. Mm -hmm. A personal brand is vulnerable. It's authentic. It's truth, right? Because that's really going to be dug into to determine whether or not you're somebody that somebody wants to invest into, hire, you know, contract with, partner with, whatever it might be. Persona is a fluff. It's this is what I want people to think of me that isn't isn't real. That's got to be a tough thing when you're a, an ex NFL player, right? And you kind of want like there's some things that you want people to know, and there's other things that you want to keep close and and stay guarded I, with. I'm one of those guys who is. I do my due diligence. Yeah. I do my homework before I partner with anybody. I've been a spokesman for, for companies for almost 40 years. Big brands too. Big and, time brands. And so with that, class and character, everything that they are, they have to see in you because you have the ability to create a name for them and move the decimal point left. Now, if you can do those things, you are a valuable asset. But I'm from the generation where your word meant everything. Wasn't a contract. If you gave me your word and we shook on it, I should be able to trust you. I don't need to find an attorney because you decided to stab me in the back or lie about something to a client. Mm. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be judged. It might not be by me, but somebody's going to judge you. You reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. And so when I look back on life, I said, well, we all have challenges. And some people you trusted, some business you trusted that went up and then went down. And you fell on the sword. Sacrifice is part of life. But my, my, my thing is, every day I get up, I feel empowered. You got God. I'm doing God's work. And I think I've had an impact on so many people in, in so many different ways over a long period of time that I know what my, what my, in this case, my mission is. And I enjoy it. I might not be able to put the uniform on and run down the field anymore. But that was part of my life, just yeah, a very yeah. short window. I'm smarter now, healthier now. Nothing really hurts anymore. And the mind is 100% sharp. So I know that I'm an asset. Now I can look at the world differently, not just for 60 minutes, yeah. which is a beautiful thing. Yeah. I was just thinking, one of our taglines as an organization is we want to make the client the hero, right? So we're happy to be behind the scenes, behind the curtain, doing all the due diligence, putting together the creative, but ultimately we want the client to be the beneficiary of that work internally and externally to whoever they're giving that product out. So as I, I, was, I was thinking about that and you talked about your, your core, your foundation being your parents. Yeah. Talk to me about, I mean, you played for some folks, man. You played for Bobby Bowden. Mm -hmm. You played for Mike Ditka. You played for Jimmy Johnson, uh, Don Shula. I mean, come on, right? That's some players, but within that. So talk to us about who are some of your heroes, because not every hero that you have, I would imagine, is is within football. There's probably a lot of other heroes that you've had based on the way, how principled and purposed you are. Who are some of your heroes? I used to call it a blessing and a curse because we grew up in Miami directly across the street from a church. Mom was a soulless, dad was a deacon. Couldn't miss Bible study, yeah. Sunday school, because they ever knew, Dennis is not in church today, crap. And so that was my foundation, spiritual commitment. And chores, <laughs> chores before any activity. Chores and, before scores. But my mom never missed a little league game. I could still see her now running down the field with one shoe, eating popcorn, run, say, run, baby, go. Or And four years at Florida State, dad never sent me a dollar. Yeah. Mom would pay rent late to send me $20 to Western Union. Things that you never forget. So the dimples that you see in the smile, that's mom. Mm -hmm. So I told myself everything I do in life would mom approve. Never want to disappoint her. I lost her at 56, 56 years old. Four years ago. Mm -mm. 1996, I lost mom. Oh, 96. I thought you said, okay, sorry. So 56. She her. was 56. She was 56 got years it. old. She was 56. Never got a chance to say goodbye. So everything I have in my head is memories. And I smile every time I think about her. When I'm in my kitchen, I'm cooking, I can hear her singing. The impact that certain people have on your life never leaves you. And when you're having a bad day, that's where I go. Ah. You know, and I said, so many people are superficial in your life as you grow who've had an impact. But what is your foundational piece that never changes? Dennis, that's interesting to hear you say that. So I lost my dad at 58. Six days. I, I was at, in a trip in Arizona. Ooh. My mom calls me. Something's wrong. Long story short, come home and, you know, six days later, we're burying him. And it's so interesting to hear you talking about those fundamental moments and experiences that 
stay with you when, you know, there's a point of decision and you don't know what to do. Right. So you wouldn't be able to tell by my shape now, but I used to play soccer in high school and you know, my dad worked second shift. He was never able to come watch any of our games. So I remember he made one game. Zendor was the championship game of soccer, whatever. And we're in overtime and the ball falls off the keeper. I put it in with my left foot, top corner. We win. I'm ecstatic. I get in the car and my dad is not ecstatic. My dad looks at me and he goes, why didn't you put it in with the right? Cause I was better with my right than my left. My dad, we won the game. Why are you upset? He goes, cause it's not about the outcome. It's about how you got there and you can't trust to get there if you're not always doing it right. So while you, you may have gotten lucky this time, do it right always. And you'll always guarantee yourself a better chance at success. And I promise you, Dennis, and the moments that have been fundamentally crucial to my life and where my life path is going, I've always had one of these moments where I, that question comes up again. Do it this way because it's the easiest way to get there or do it right, even though it may be painful but it will guarantee you a better chance of success. And by the way, for my teammates that have experienced this life with me, it's the same thing that is core to how I hope I inspire them. Just because you have an easy way out, there's a reason you're being asked to do it a certain way, and it will guide you towards a better set of decision-making principles, and it will help you long-term. So it's interesting. I'd say to people all the time, do not surround yourself with yes people. Surround mm -hmm. yourself with the people that will challenge you at the highest levels. And then what you will find is that you have true friends and not just the ones that are there for the yeses and the successes. They'll be there when the water gets a little turbulent. But it's interesting to hear you like just talk about the memories of the singing, the smell, the cooking. Like I remember certain things like that. And I, I think it's a principle we should all take. You shouldn't be just a, a fly by night in somebody else's life. Try to make an impact on somebody. Uh, one phrase that I live by is compliment, not criticize. Because you don't know what someone's journey is as opposed to yours. And so many people today have lost faith, lost direction on looking for a savior or looking for just some encouragement. You know, we, you know, I remember the, the, the crack epidemic and how communities were just disappearing. Mm -hmm. Government didn't care. Then the opioid crisis hit. Then they put things in the law to protect those because it was more white collar. The world we live in is still black and white. No matter what, the country we, that we love, that we bear their flag, our history is not good in terms of how we've treated people. You know, and I, and I think with that, we can't live by what history is. We can make our own history. So how you treat people is up to you. Yep. We can have a conversation all day about history and what was good and what was bad and what's wrong with these laws and all those kind of things. But you're not in a position where you can win that war. I concentrate on what's ahead of me and what's in front of me and what I can change and the impact I have on people's lives. So I'm, an, I mean, I said at one point in my life, velvet voice of versatility, I talk. I always want to be in a communication situation where I can communicate and we can talk and we can have a discussion because then I can get to your soul. Because if I can get rid of the anger, then you'll, be, you'll feel free in sharing. That's the thing. We have to get beyond shouting at everybody yeah. and listening to your story. You know, that's so, that's so key. Like <clears throat> so far too often people want to go from a negative to a positive. Like you have to get to neutral first. Mm -hmm. You have to get people to neutral in their mind, in their heart. And that's where folks start to open up and that's where you can start chipping away. I think like we're in that faster, faster now, now society where it's like, well, if I just do this, I can get that. It's quick, 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 quick. Well, this is not something that is going to be as quick as we all would like it to be unless we can first get everyone kind of neutral, which is accepting the fact that we all need to be kinder to each other, that there is a challenge, that we got to communicate better. Like that's the neutral point. And then you could start chipping away and things will ultimately get better. Have you ever gone through drive through McDonald's, they forgot your fries. <laughs> see, fast food. See, this see, is the second this, time you brought up fries today. I'm getting you some fries. You go inside and yeah. sit. Dennis is hungry. Because they make mistakes through drive through Yeah. And I don't need to be getting agitated and upset because I didn't <laughs> get my fries. But Dennis, to that point, that, that's a fundamental, what did you expect? If you're trying to get through fast, right. you may get more errors. I'm more the type of person I'd like to sit and get to know you a little bit and have a conversation. It's called patience. Yes. You've got to have patience because we want results so quick now. Was it Craig? 
one shot coffee cup. Yeah, yeah. Or one, you know, yeah. or the little red, the stuff. red bubbles. Yeah. Look at all social media. I, Boom, I, red I'm, bubbles. I like the old percolator. It takes a while for the coffee to make. It's time for the percolator. So I appreciate when I finally get it. Yep. I mean, so appreciation means patience. Yep. They go hand in hand. You know, so a lot of times, if I'm on a sales call, I'm upset because he didn't say or she didn't say yes. That's okay. Because give it a week or two, they're going to circle back to me and say, you know what, we could have taken you off. I said, yeah, but two weeks have passed. My price went up. Yep. Because you, did, you didn't do your due diligence. I'm very good at what I do. So you went to somebody else. You outsourced. You didn't get the results. You want now you want me. My price went up. Because it's called disrespect. And if you'd have known because it was a referral that I'm the man. Well, you should put in more time into understanding what you have in front of you and not making me do the work for you. Yeah. I mean, so, so with that, everybody gets a mulligan. You get a yeah. chance to make one mistake, but it's going to cost you. Yep. That's what, that's why I always say you do it with a smile. You can't upset me. I'm okay. Yeah. But Kill them with kindness. Yeah. But you're going to realize I'm the man for the job. Some of the, yeah, I mean, the best relationships, the best uh, clients that I think that we've had, and I know that I've had in business were the ones that said no initially, went to somebody else did not get the result and then ultimately come back. Right. That that's really, that's really powerful. Yes, it is. But to your point, if they would have taken the time up front to do a little bit more research, to get to know me a little bit better, to look into what the organization does, to look at the track record through social media and through previous work, or even we'll offer up. You want to talk to a couple other people that I've worked with. You talked about a referral. Yeah. Happy to do that. And guess what? You would have avoided the crisis and we would have got right to it, and you would have had a better price. The information is always available. It's to always you. available. If you don't do it or look at it, that means you're just lazy. That's a bad crate to have in this Lazy is not a good crate. Mm -mm. I think the one that a lot of people miss out on is being interested. Right? And I tell people all the time, and you're, you're asking what we think is the right decision. Have you done the due diligence to understand, first of all, fundamentally what is most important to you that will drive you to the outcome? And in the gap between those two, who's the best partner for that? that opportunity, right? And we'll do this. Uh, so we have a different approach here at Club Colors. A lot of times it has nothing to do. Like if somebody's like, hey, I'm looking, tell us about you first. What do you need to achieve? Who are the people you're trying to inspire? What are the opportunities that you're trying to use to inspire those people? And then we'll take that approach and come back with a formula, solutions. It may not even be product. You may not have to spend money. Maybe it's just a little message shift. Maybe it's the words you're using. So I think in a lot of ways, those are long-term partnerships to us are the, the primary goal of why we do what we do. The transactional thing, there's plenty of online retailers you could go buy this stuff at. We're not going to compete with them in price. But what you will get from us is a team that will have your back, that you can go to sleep and not have to wonder about whether your stuff is going to be there. Um, and I think those are the intangibles that make our service something fundamentally different than our competitors. To your point, though, the price decision, right, is mm -hmm. often the quick the quick decision, right? Yep. That's the easy decision. Law of price, right? Folks always want to ask. I tell salespeople this all the time. Like when somebody asks what the price is, if you answer, you might as well just get up and walk out. Yep. <laughs> that is never talk price with somebody until you're ready to talk price with them. When are you ready to talk price with them? When you're ready to talk price with them, which means you've established enough benefit. They know enough about you. They've got enough resources. They understand. They've seen enough. They feel comfortable. They actually know who you are. They know what you're driven by, your purpose, all those things. Never talk price until that. But the client who always wants to ask for price up front, they always want to know price. They're looking to make a quick, easy decision because they got three other in the hopper they're waiting on. Who's going to have the best price? That's not the one you want. That's not a partnership. That's a transaction, right? Yeah, so it, it's one of those things I, I changed over time. I used to always do dinner and lunches. Stopped. Yeah. And uh, started doing coffee. I started looking at what it was charging me or costing me not to close the deal. I said, you know what? I'm the boss. You don't get to see me unless we get ready to sign paper. Yeah. We can talk all day. We can Zoom all day, but I ain't driving to see you until you, unless you're going to send me an electronic offer. You don't get to see me. And uh, it, because you have to value who you are and what you're worth. Because people would take advantage of the first chance they get and they try to undercut you. Mm -hmm. In my industry, especially when you're doing like signings, you might be my best friend. You had me do an event for you. I charge you a price because you're my friend. But you told some other people you got me for that price. So when they call me, they think they can get me for that. Uh, no, because that price was good when there was no internet. 
Now everybody now is marketing. And so I did a signing years ago. You remember Wilbur Marshall? Mm -hmm. Wilbur was a beast. I got to fly him in, him and Willie Galt for an event. And Wilbur calls me a week later. He said, uh, we got a problem. What are you talking about? So he sends me a screenshot. He says, see that guy that was in the line? He paid $35 for that jersey. I said, I know. He said, but he's selling it on eBay for seven fifty. dollars You're not getting anything for that. So, anyway. I, so I said, we can't control what the general public does. All we can do is control what we negotiate. This is a learning thing. We have no control of free marketing. I said, so that just tells us now that there's such a demand now for your product that when we do a negotiation for your contract, we ask for more money. He said, this is just a blip. No, no worries. But I'm glad you brought me to my attention because now I started paying more attention. I'm from the old days where, you know, you get a pack of, of cards with a stick of gum mm -hmm. and the kids would trade the card. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. They're not, they're not online checking everything in terms of what the market value is. We can talk about cards yeah. if you'd like. Wait, wait, we're talking cards now. Like that industry changed. So, so, like I said, the world keeps evolving. Yeah. Everything keeps evolving. If you don't involve with it, you're going to be left in the bat seat wondering what, what, what happened. You know, so you had to be smart. You had to do more research and understanding value. And I picked it up pretty quickly. And, uh, and so I learned never say yes. And Dennis, I think there's, there's a business principle in that, right? I think one of the things that we challenge ourselves here is how do we determine value that we provide to our clients? Are there KPIs in place? Because otherwise, a whole season will pass right in front of your eyes, right? Blockbuster had the monopoly on everything. Right. And they failed to realize that the world was changing, the delivery mechanisms were changing. They thought that because they were the incumbent and they had been ingrained in how people lived, people go buy the VHS, go home, pop it in, that they were indestructible. Guess what? Netflix steps in, does what they do, and then they're gone off to the races. I think COVID accelerated a lot of the virtual services that need to be offered. Amazon was a primary winner of that, right? I mean, my, my five-year-old knows Amazon, knows the truck, knows what it looks like, knows what time it shows up. These are behavioral things that are being ingrained in this world. And I think if you're a business owner and, and you're trying to put your head in the sand of this too shall pass, the answer is you will become a memory, a, a thing of past brick and mortar. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And by the way, brick and mortar is interesting because brick and mortar has an opportunity, but it's no longer about the product. It's about the experience. Like if people come to your brick and mortar, you better have somebody at the front door welcoming them. How are you doing? Can I offer you a cup of coffee? Would you like this? Would you like some, would you like a guided approach to what you're here to do today? Otherwise People are, number one, either A, not going to show up, or number two, they're just going to go on their phone while they're in their, your store and price match and buy it somewhere else. So you got to offer more. And I think, you know, that goes back to just always challenge if you have a business. Yeah. You're, in, you're in business because you provide value. Always be questioning if you're still providing the same value that you were providing because it's all changing. Good and bad. Options are good and bad. I was going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I think with that, when you talk about the experience, if you go into a store, you kind of know the sales rep. They know you. They know what you kind of like. And I think with that, the experience was, if I buy from you, if there's a problem, I can always call you. And you'd actually answer and respond as opposed to an automated service or someone who doesn't really know, who doesn't really care. They don't care about the sale. No, no. We have relationships going back to like Ace Hardware, those old school. Not big box stores anymore. I mean, the old school where everybody knew everybody. Like the neighborhood store. Yeah, I mean, so that part of it is gone. Yep. You know, they've been phased out, you know, and, and right now we're in this flux about, there's a reason why there's free delivery for everything. If you pay up to a certain amount, yeah, that's nice. Um, uh, yeah, but if it doesn't fit, I got to send it back. More times than not, it doesn't fit. Right. So if you think you're saving a buck, now you're up. It's More times than not, even if it doesn't fit, you're too lazy to put it back in the mail, so yeah. you end up with it. And, and so I just re-box, re-gift, and yep. give it to somebody else. Well, it's interesting. White elephant <laughs> gift during yeah, Christmas. Exactly. 
<laughs> say what was you that? Give me, you give me size 12 shoes? What, yeah, what's what's that? Say, I can always find up. somebody that can use this stuff. So, But within, within that experience of this online thing, I think there's such an opportunity. Like you imagine having a local store that has used its technology. Don't get me wrong. Technology is great, but they have your order history. They have your profile. They know what you like to buy. And you have a personal shopper with you guiding you through this is brand new, or if it's clothing, we know your style. You like blue, black, orange. So they like walk you through. Walk, they, so they, like they they do a virtual like tour. Yes. At the store, so the bricks and mortar is still there. You don't have to go in. They walk you through. They lay it out or on the you, table. You're setting up an appointment with them. Yeah. So show up at one o'clock. You got 15 minutes. They already have they everything your merchandise out. for you. you. You can feel it, touch it, try a couple. I'm pretty of sure we on. just opened a business. That's Listen, like, is this like a pop up on your screen? Yeah, yes, it is. could be. You, you think about that and then you leave with that. It's, it, it is an on location, but I, to me, I hate shopping. I only shop, but we're going to do a plug here. Maybe yeah. Johnson Murphy. <laughs> Johnson Murphy. He <laughs> drives to the airport to shop. This is where I shop. He shops right at the airport. I, so I bring my, my luggage. I go in terminal B. It's right by B six mm-hmm. at O'Hare. I walk in, I have my two favorite guys, Chris and Tony. Chris knows me. How you doing? I see here are the four new items that just came in. You'd like put them in the bag. The shoes, you'll like this, put them in the bag. To me, that that is the experience I look for, right? I tried Stitch Fix. It wasn't for me. Other people like it, but not for me. I prefer that. But he got the shirt that I had been wearing like the week before. That was the first thing he got. He's like, that's it. I'm, I'm not wearing what he wears. See, that's it. Everywhere you go, you need, <laughs> you need to be treated like a rock star because it doesn't matter how much money you make or don't make. Mm-hmm. It's about how you treat it. Yep. Yeah. That is everything. You know, I'm all about quality. So if I find something that I like, I'm superstitious anyway. If I can get it from you, I'm not going anywhere else. Right. And you need to know that. <laughs> I think people are loyal by nature, though. I think, like, people want to find loyalty, right? And so my late father used to say all the time, like, every business is a people business. Yes. And ultimately, you want to connect with a person. You want to connect with a person who knows you, understands you, cares about you at whatever level that is, but has a level of care is going to correct a mistake if there's one made. Right. And I think that that's kind of being lost a little bit in this fast paced technology based world that we're, that we're operating in, which means that there's gotta be a way to take the technology part and add the people part. And then you've got an explosion, right? So I don't know if that's one of the easy ways we were talking, I think we were talking to a client about this. FaceTime is an easily available feature on iPhones and Androids. Imagine having a live video chat capability with some of these online stores where I can have a conversation with somebody that's real, mm-hmm. not one of these bots, yeah. right? I mean, and maybe you pay a Prime Plus service fee where I get a personal person that can guide me through a decision. I'm lucky I have friends that know technology. I don't know technology that well. And one of my friends, Dave, Dave's picks. He'll put Dave's out, picks. We'll ask for, hey, who's got a recommendation on a TV? Dave, within 15 minutes, we'll He's got a guy. send you three things, why, what this will do for you, and either value, premium, or whatever his other thing is. But that, I think, is what, in a lot of ways, a consumer is starving for, is attention. People want attention. To your point, whether or not you're a millionaire or not, the in common is we as humans like interaction. We like attention. And if you don't, you have plenty of options options for that. But if you do, you don't have as many options for that. And I think that's where the gap is. I think there will be a a shift or uh, some other uh, companies that are going to innovate interaction to where you can start to feel like somebody cares about your money and spending money with them instead of just getting your product as quick as possible. That's uh, why I found it so easy over the years to partner with certain companies um, to represent their product is you feel like you get in bed with the product. You know it like the back of your hand. Mm -hmm. And you can talk about it where it's real. Mm -hmm. It's not a sales pitch. It's something I actually wear, use, or drink. And I have a conviction. And so the oratorical skills come out. But your passion, you can't fake that. You can't. You know, and I still tell people, said, you know, sometime when you you look at employees, you got to figure out what they're good at. I've never been one who sit in an office and go over and up, mm, put me outside. Mm-hmm. Take me outside the gate and let me loose. Yeah. I'm a people's person. And, and from that standpoint, it's about always feeling as you have to prove yourself. It's part of my DNA. I've always felt I was the best 
at everything that I've ever been able to do. But somehow I always told you that I wasn't that good. I always felt I had to prove that I was better. That travels with me everywhere I go. And I think it, that's the pride that you carry with you. But at the same time, it's a situation where I feel that I'm God's gift that I need to share. So I try to constantly do that every day with someone who might be struggling. Because the struggle is real. Those who have lost their way, just need guidance or inspiration. The kind of thing that I can do now that I'm in a later part of my life. Whereas I'm not on a whistle, I'm on a clock. Yeah. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt too, right? Yes, I mean, so I believe I'm on the other side for a reason. Never take, take advantage of that. Who are some of the best leaders that you ever had a chance to, to interact with? I, I, I find this interesting too, right? So you look at the folks to get to that high level of professional sports, and you would have to imagine that like on their eighth grade team, they were the leader, right? Mm-hmm. And then their sophomore year, they were the leader. And then they go to college, right? And there's, there's some folks that were leaders getting up to that point. And now all of a sudden you've got 10 leaders in there. How does that leader uh, of the leaders kind of, kind of start to, to take shape? And then you get to the NFL and there's another level of leader. So you've had to have been around some of the best leaders in that regard, but in the locker room, in that development of a team, how do you take all those leaders that have been leaders for so long? And then how does that kind of take shape where it's like, obviously Michael Jordan, like, you know, you knew he was a leader from the get-go, right? The guy walked on the court, but I would imagine like in some teams, maybe you look at the Chicago bears right now. I mean, who's their leader right now? They don't have one, but those guys were all leaders. So how does that happen? How does that happen? How does a whole bunch of leaders their whole life get into a locker room and then you can't figure out who the heck the leader is? You, that wasn't a problem on the 85 Bears. But I think what you have is everybody is, is blessed with talent. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you got to get out of your own way because when you shut down being able to listen and you're the smartest in the room, you're already defeated. In a team sport, you just got to figure out where you fit in. Be very good at that. And then make yourself irreplaceable. Once you do that, yeah. okay, you got a seat at the table. They're not going to win without you. So to me, it's not about who gets their name written up in the paper all the time, who gets all the interviews. I know what I do and what, I, and what I'm good at. And if I don't do that, we're not successful. So it's not always about trying to get the glory. Yeah. You know, as long as I'm on a plane, we're going somewhere. I'm good. So how does that work? I mean, does that come through coaching? Is that something that – that is talked about in the locker room, like, hey, look, or is that a self-realization where you're like, hey, look, I, I can return punts better than anybody on this team, and if this team's going to win, then I, nobody goes over the middle the way that I do. I'll take that I'll take that hit over the middle to catch that ball. Like, how, how does that happen, or, or is that a discussion that happens? Does somebody come and put their arm around you and say, hey, man, if you want to stay in this team, you better, you better catch that ball over the middle? The film doesn't lie. Okay. You can talk your way – into a lot of things, but the film doesn't lie. And I think you have to put in the work, be the first in, the last to leave, lead by example, not be threatened by seniority, because a lot of time that does happen when you're the new kid on the block. Someone's gonna tell you the wrong play, wrong formation, haze you and all those kind of things. They're, you're being tested. Really? And so to me is if your faith is good, you're prepared for the test. And I think with that is, yes, I mean, I've been in the front of the line my entire life, always the leader, never a backup. And I was a kid that was afraid of public speaking. Being in the classroom, I was always in the back because I was afraid of being in the front and raising my hand if I didn't know. You feel there's an embarrassment tied to them. A lot of athletes feel disappointment. They're sitting in the back. I always wanted to be in the front. And I learned that oratorical skills allowed me to be comfortable in front of people. They started paying you to talk. What? (laughs) So I found strength by not hiding, making myself vulnerable, asking the right questions, and putting in the work. So once you really start filling in the spaces in your life where you are vulnerable and you get a a coat of armor, you're invincible. And I looked at that. Everywhere you go, someone's going to be afraid of who you are. They're going to test you. But this is nothing new to me. You should be glad that I'm here because I'm here to change things. So you got to have confidence in who you are, no matter what somebody says to you. I'm just gonna, at the end of the day, I'm going to be here. What about you? 
Dennis, one of the things that that ties into, and this is, I think, fundamentally leaders, whether it is uh, by title, whether it is by personality, whether it is just how things are constructed in your role in it, have vision. And I think back to your your statement about confidence, confidence comes with understanding where you're going mm-hmm. and having a plan. And even if you don't know all the pieces of how to get there, you got to have a plan, right? So I speak to my friends all the time and people I know, and I always have short-term, near-term, long-term. Well, it's going to be pretty hard for your, you to set up short-term goals if you don't know what the long-term objectives are. By the way, it doesn't have to stay that way, but you got to have something you're striving for, something, because it will tell you, here are the gaps I have, here are the weaknesses, here's the stuff I need to work at. And I think in a lot of ways, again, just like a business needs to change their objectives, I think us as humans, you're not a, a one-trick pony. We're fluid. It can change your environment. But look at COVID. One of the things that I think is the most dangerous components of what COVID did the health thing is a thing all to itself. Yes. I think it killed a lot of people's dreams. Mm-hmm. I think it stunted different. Imagine people at small businesses, you're gone. What happened? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a victim of circumstances. Well, you have a lot of mental issue, uh, health issues in this country already. Now you throw on top of that isolation, you throw on top of it, just people losing actual people yeah. and just the hope. And I remember one of our big things in the organization was, you know, just taking the time to start to dream again. Just we're getting through this, but don't forget to dream. Cause that's, I, I think that's a beautiful thing about the human experience is we can dream. We can set objectives because we have that ability to step outside of our circumstances and imagine that there can be more. And I think that was one of the things that was, you just see it in people's eyes, their spirit is just gone. And uh, it's tough seeing that. That's the hardest part about seeing, you know, the human experience is when somebody's lost that faith. Well, I think a lot of us who couldn't swim got thrown in the deep end. You had to figure out a way to how to survive. That's what COVID did. Yes, people lost their jobs. A lot of people took their life savings and started their own company and had to shut down. You know, then you're looking at being head of household and there's no income coming in. So now you're spiraling into depression. So now all that weights on your, a lot of the co- churches were closed. You, you couldn't go yeah. pray. You know, so you felt isolated with so much stress and so much pressure. What do you do? You know, and I, and I think that if there was a time that we turned to our God and our faith, it was during COVID. Because the government really didn't care about you. You're on your own. And, um, and I think with that, it's about looking at each other, trusting each other, relying on people that you never would never rely on. And just to be able to communicate that you're not alone. From a business standpoint, a lot of businesses just shut down. A lot of industries just shut down. Like my industry, hospitality is shut down totally. So I was like, okay, I'm glad I know how to save. You know, and I think with that is every day I got up, I might not be able to go to work, but I was alive. You build on that every single day. A lot of people aren't. So to me, I'm still here because God had a purpose for me. Don't throw that purpose away. See who you can help. You know, get back on their feet. Find direction. And find strength. Find someone that they can talk to or call at 3 in the morning when they just don't feel like being here any longer. Those are the things that you talk about. And so I know that I am here to help. More important than anything else. And uh, being available, you don't have to make an appointment with me. Just call. Yeah. That's the most thing that's important. Chris talks all the, all the time about uh, being interested. Being available is another great one. Our guest uh, on our last podcast talked about stay engaged, right? Absolutely. I mean, it, it seems to me that when, when I have a chance to interact with successful people, there's such a commonality. There's a commonality in, in the way that they think. And one of those core values is do for others, right? If you're always giving, it comes back. It always does. But to your point, I mean, isolation is like a key component to depression. And if you find somebody isolated, man, you better give some time, some some reasoning, some advice, some help, some love, something. And that will ultimately come back. And then you, you'll start to build this community of people. Where- I interned at, at Florida State when I was a senior, when I was finding what my major was going to be in criminology at a juvenile detention center. The average age was 13. Jeez. 
13 years old, some who parents had dropped them off to the state because they couldn't deal with. I had two twin boys, 14 years old. Rape. Broke my heart. Mm. And I'm looking at them, you're behind a cell. 22 hours a day, you get two hours out. This is your life. It hasn't even begun yet. You don't even pay taxes. Mm. But sometimes when you don't have someone to look forward to, look up to, who's going to guide you, this is what happens. And a lot of those kids don't even get visitors from family at all. Jeez. Normally a psychiatrist or a doctor or a pastor, your family doesn't even come to see you. You're discarded. <laughs> and I look back on that on so many young men that I grew up with that had that fate. That why, why was I different where this could have been me? So when you hear that gate locked, you have no more freedom at all. That's not something you wish on anybody. And I think with that is all you have to do is make one wrong turn. And then you start praying because you're on your own. And if someone does not reach out and pull you back, you're just another statistic. I never wanted to be a statistic. My mom would have been very disappointed. Yeah, that wouldn't have gone well. No. And uh, I was more afraid of mom than any cop. It's called respect. Respect does not change. So I see young women and men yelling at their parents like, I I could have never got away with that. Mm -hmm. But more importantly is show some respect, show some love. Because they could kick you out any no more. You come home, the locks will be changed. Be thankful that you have your parents. You know, and uh, they're the ones who are struggling. You're just on your phone all day. That's not a life. You know, so from, from, from that perspective, this generation needs to show more appreciation. Our generation earned everything. Here's a handout. You feel like you're privileged, that you're entitled. No, you're not. Pay your dues first which I totally believe in. I, th- I think one of the other, I think it's a, it, it's another fundamental, one of these learnings. And I, I've got a different experience than a lot of folks that were born here. Right. I mean, we came to this country, I was four and a half years old. And I remember my first two years in school, I didn't even know the language. I got in trouble just because, and I still found a way to, you know, make friends with the teacher, Mrs. Cohen. I still remember her second grade teacher finally figured out I had no clue what the hell they were talking about, <laughs> but I ended up because of the communication thing and building a community. I think that the, the, the framework of my childhood was absolutely based on discipline. And that doesn't mean anything, but you have respect for the people that allow you to do things. You have respect for the fact that you have an opportunity and you have a responsibility to add value to your circle of things. Like, I, you know, I, I don't understand, you know, some of these folks that come out of their communities where the community needs help, they make it. How do you not contribute back? And then I think that is the missing gap to how communities can make a difference if there is a collective effort to work together, to encourage people, to bring that. It's a different perspective. There is hope. You, you don't have to end up with the same outcomes. You know, in a lot of ways, our family, so my mom washed, uh, cleaned houses. My dad washed machine parts. The one thing that was never false was work and work ethic. My dad worked 14 hours a day. I saw him for usually an hour in the morning. How'd you do? What did you learn in school? And if I didn't have a good answer, it wasn't a good morning for me. So I think there is that whole, it's a responsibility. You, you're accountable. Yes. You're responsible. And I think that is, uh, in a lot of ways, you don't have responsibility to be friends with your children. You have a responsibility to set them up for success through the principles that got you to where, and that doesn't mean you have to be a complete whatever, but that respect is an important component of that, that you don't have, you have not had enough experience to whether you have an opinion. My mom used to tell me that all the time. You're 12, 13. You don't know what the heck you're talking about. And I thank them every day. I mean, the, the amount of discipline that they imparted mm-hmm. on me. And I wouldn't be where I'm at if, if I didn't have that in my life. And see, that's the thing. I think it's uh, more talking about business. Accountability is everything. Nobody wants to be micromanaged and all those kind of things. I hear, I hear that all the time. I'm like, well, if I trust you, I don't have to micromanage you. And so, but if I put you in charge of something, you don't get it done. That comes back on me. I've already vetted you. You don't want to embarrass me, you know, because there's somebody else who would love to take your seat. 
but I trust you will do the work. And if, if you do the work, then we can get to the next project, then the next project. You know, trust is earned. Anybody can fill out a resume, but when I put you to work, can I turn my back on you and I will not be disappointed? Yep. That's something that you always look at. Because sometimes when the first thing I heard about this, you know, Zoom learning at home, I said, yeah, your employees at home, unsupervised. We're going to see how good your, productive, how your productivity is now that they're not in the office. Some things change when nobody's looking over your shoulder. The great ones never worry. Yep. Just put yeah. me anywhere. I'll yeah. get the job done. They yeah. do. They just go do. That's it. They just go do. And, you, you know, to your point, I know that there's a whole lot of people out there that really like this, well, we're work remote now thing. I don't know how as an organization you can really maintain culture, build culture, establish true principle and purpose and uphold that get into the minds and hearts of people. I mean, just think about it from this standpoint. Like, how do you, how do you put your, your hand on somebody's shoulder? And it, I'm not talking about like in a weird way, right? But just like from, from man to man or woman to woman, just to go, it's going to be okay. You know, it's, it, it, that touch, that little touch can make a difference. And maybe I'm breaking an HR policy. Maybe no. you're not supposed to touch people anymore. I don't know. I think we're still humans. Like, no, shaking just, the hand, putting no. a hand on somebody's shoulder. Like, if we just want a window in your office and a door that doesn't close so that someone can actually see you. And it's human resources. First word is human. Yeah. We're all human. You know, the policies might change, but the spirit doesn't. What was acceptable yesterday now is not acceptable. So I got to change how I look at you, how I talk to you. I've never been explicit in terms of complimenting you, but now what I say can be misconstrued a different way. Really? That's what's wrong. We are a sensitive culture now. And there's a lot of things I said when I was 18. I don't, I'm not proud of today, but you're allowed to make a mistake. You're human, right? Well, but that's you, like what Dave Chappelle said. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you see that stand up. Yeah. You know, so too many things today make you self-righteous that the world just developed today, that everything that happened before today does not exist. I wasn't aware that nobody had made a mistake before. We have to apparently all be perfect, and we're not allowed to make any type of mistake at the risk of being canceled or having it brought up or having your personal brand wrecked. People make mistakes all the time, daily. I'll make 15 more today, the, but it shouldn't be dragged to the mud for it. The competition is has... The game has changed from the standpoint of, I remember when I was growing up, I had a certain group of friends or the community. We all rooted each other on, mm -hmm. hey, you got a new job. Great. How's it going? Great. You got to make a move, whatever. It doesn't matter. I feel like in a lot of ways, uh, the definition of winning has become more individual yeah. instead of the community and the group of friends and all this other type of stuff. So I call it the me, me, me over we, we, we. And one of them leads you down the path of, okay, so you're the lone wolf. You're blazing a path forward. What happens when you turn around and you don't have a pack with you? Mm -hmm. You're going to get old at some point. You're going to become obsolete at some point. I'd rather run with a group of folks that we're all pushing each other. We're raising the tide for all boats, right? And I think, you know, it's, it's a dangerous world in a lot of ways now because of social media because nothing takes time to spread anymore. You know, you used to be able to say a thing in a group of friends and then you'd all get together at the bar and that's when everybody figured it out. You post something on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever – the entire world knows about it immediately. And therefore, I also think it stifles conversation. You can't have discussion anymore. You can't have arguments. You can't have conflict. So what's the benefit of that long term? You don't have opposing views. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't have opposing views, you'd end up with a culture of yes, no, maybe so. And it, I think it actually makes it more black and white instead of shades of gray, which is where the beauty of the human experience is. So it's, it's a very interesting, in, which is why I don't take part in Facebook. I don't have, you know, all these other, what is it? Chat snap, chat what is, snap, whatever that is. We'll call it chat snap. I just, you know, I prefer this over anything. I it, prefer, you know, gotta, table I gotta, time. I'm, I got to see you. I got to feel you. I got to touch yeah. you. I've got to feel that, that aura. Yeah. Because that's real, you know, and your feelings can change from minute to minute. You can't do that just online. Okay. And, uh, with, you know, with a facial imprint, but it's, um, I think all the stuff that is done online, especially from a business perspective, should be with the purpose of getting to the human connection. Yeah. 
right? So it should be, it should be a demonstration of the type of aura that you might feel if I came in contact with you in, in a live presence, right? That's why like, um, from a social media standpoint, doing video content is far more powerful or a picture is far more powerful than text. Um, like to actually hearing the voice, seeing the expressions. That's why we do this podcast, right? So you can understand and hear what our guest is all about beyond what you think they were when they put on their jersey and what they played. Who is Dennis McKinnon really, or at least the pieces that you're going to give us today? Because there's so many layers to who you are. But who's Chris Tossi really? Who's John Morris really? How do we really think, right? Those Those things all are designed to help people understand who you are so that when they get in contact with you and they have that personal connection and you're sitting at the boardroom table and you're actually having the conversation, you've got a higher level of trust. There's a consistency because now you've gotten to know me before you actually know me, which is pretty powerful. And so I think that it's a really interesting, we have a really strong chance in business and society of going one way, way too far or one way, uh, the other way, way too far. And I think that to your point, we can find that shade of gray where it's not all staying on Zoom. It's not all staying on social media and this persona thing. It's personal brand to create personal experience and connection, real connection in person, in-person connection. That's we, we can't lose that as a society. I feel like we're going that direction. What we're trying to do is eliminate you having an opinion. Yes. And... More times than not, when you're in a boardroom, people are afraid of raising their hands or asking a question because they're being judged. Or, you know, I, I, I really have something to say, but I don't know if I can say it in here. I feel more comfortable on Zoom as opposed to being in there with everybody. I said, well, there's a reason why you're here. You're already vetted. Your opinion matters. Mm -hmm. Silence is deafening. When I say that, I always, it takes me back to dealing with abused women. Your silence has you paralyzed. You need to talk. There's so many people sharing your pain that are willing to help you that you never have to deal with this by yourself. And, and I think that's the, the thing about understanding who you are, your values, your self-worth, and being prideful. You don't get to disrespect me. I'm going to talk to somebody who listens, plain and simple. You know, so when you're, when you're talking about texting, people will text you with bad news. Mm-hmm. When everything's fine, they want to call and talk and say, well, you got bad news. You can't talk to me all of a sudden. Yeah. And then you text me in the middle of the night when you know I'm asleep. Yeah. See, that's a little passive aggressive, don't you think? No, that's called being a coward. Yeah. I was trying to be nice. That's, a, that's a, <laughs> coward and lazy go hand in hand. Yeah, they sure do. They're, they have no place in my life. Then no. it's so I've got a thing. We've had some folks that have had challenges in life, right? Or opportunities. I look at them as opportunities, not challenges. Yes. So one of my favorite sayings is there's not many things you can't fix in your immediate surrounding without 30, uh, with 30 seconds of courage. 30 seconds of courage. You could fix personal situations, friend situations. And a lot of people end up living in this, in this muddy world where it's like, well, if I tell them that, then they're going to be upset. And all. 30 seconds of courage. Here's how I really feel about you. Guess what's going to happen? Either you save a friendship or you move on and it was going to happen anyway, but you just saved months of time instead of 30 seconds of courage. I mean, I could have got out of this relationship a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. you know, and, but that's the thing is you're afraid of hurting somebody's feeling, but not being honest about how you feel. Yep. Yeah. And I'm like, that's regret. I knew I should have never said yes to coming to this thing. I, I, I wanted to say no, but I was so concerned about how she would say, how she would feel. Yeah. And you're miserable the entire time. Yep. And I'm like, see, so courage is a badge you should wear all the time. And by the way, that experience is not only terrible for you, it's, it's terrible, terrible yeah. for her. Yeah. You, you brought a bad aura in that, in that, uh, <laughs> that meeting. But, but it's, it's a not happy with, I can tell you that. <laughs> you know, it's a missed opportunity for both just yeah. because there, there was an, an opportunity missed to just be honest. And I think honesty is another trait. And a characteristic in, in this world that's not appreciated as much as it should be. And, you know, one of my, I, so I'm known as, we're editing some of this, right? I'm known as the asshole in my group of friends. Because they know if, if people call we're me. We're not editing that. <laughs> people call me, here's, here's what you're going to get. You, you may not get what you want to hear, but you're going to get exactly what is on my mind. And I think that it's such a good way to do business also. Where people don't wonder, you know, am I in good standing? 
bad standing? Am I valuable? Am I not? I, you know, as far as I'm concerned in the company, our, our responsibility is to be honest with our teammates because mm -hmm. we're asking them to spend time with us and to bet on us. You've got to be honest with your people. You've, and again, I think the, the, this should translate over and flow over to your personal relationships. If you've got friends or people you call friends that are not people that you genuinely look forward to spending time with and seeing and coaching and mentoring and being a part of, what are you really doing? You're just, you're diluting your time for the real people because you got all these other people that you're trying to keep a status up for. So I like narrowing down my groups all the time. I, I always go through an evaluation process in my mind of, you know, am I giving enough, enough time and am I getting enough value out of the situation? And, you know, it's led to some folks that have come and gone, uh, but it's also opened the door for a lot of new folks that, you know, I get to play a part of their lives and they get to play, you know, a significant part of mine. So I, I just think it should always evolve. It shouldn't just be a thing that just is there because time. Some of the best stories that you get are people who said you had an impact on their life. And uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I was thinking about this and, and now I saw a game or I heard you speak and it made me look at my life a little differently. So you never know when you're going to touch someone and learning how to be honest and being able to accept whatever answer someone gives you and don't take it too personal. You know, and it's, um, it is Tuesday after a terrible loss on a Monday night. And then, you know, you get up and you got, you know, 20 or 30 reporters want to talk. I'm like, I can't keep talking about the same stuff over and over. There are things about life now where the world has changed that are more important to me about policy, about laws that are changing, people who are struggling, people who've been wrong. I want to talk more about that. Football only had eight years of my life. Mm -hmm. I've moved on from that. I can talk about it at length, but I'm in a different lane. And it's um, because to me is all the education I have has been sitting on a shelf. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now it's like, okay, I can talk about all those things now. I can figure out where I can help, where I can plug myself in and be the team player I've always been. That's more important to me. Like I said, 1990. Ooh, that's a long time ago. I've been retired that long. I know. That that's what was the, that's why it was so important. I mean, as you mentioned, you you've you've identified all these different lanes for yourself. And there's so many layers to who you are as a person. And so that's why I was saying earlier on, like, does it get annoying to just be, you know, kind of introduces 1985 Super Bear uh, Super Bowl Chicago Bear? But at the same time, you have now this platform to be able to do all of these things that to capture people's attention and maybe to get people to, to listen a little bit harder because of that. The great thing about that, yeah. it allows people to be comfortable. Yeah. Because they look at you in a different way. I still have my cape because they look at it as a superhero still that at a time where they couldn't even get close to us, that now you can touch and feel and hear me. Mm -hmm. So I have a story to tell, but at the same time, I need to hear about you. What can I do to help? I was, if I don't know, I know somebody that can help. That's the thing about being able to give because you don't know the impact this person have on the world. They just need a push, you know, and someone to actually trust them, to listen to them. You know, so I know what my purpose is. And football is, is just something that breaks bread. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's rye, it's wheat, it's pumpernickel, stuff that I don't even like. Damn, I'm hungry. <laughs> no, and, then, you know, so it, it's from, from that perspective, it's this is my favorite time of year. It's football season. Yeah. People are a lot nicer. They just are. And they want to talk about their kids. My, my son's going through this. My daughter's going through this. She's the first this. And, you know, because I'm, I'm part of gender nine, you know, uh, title nine and gender equity and being a feminist and understand equal rights for all. And for all the little girls who aspire to be great, who never had a sponsor, you know, and I know what talent is, you know, and okay, mom, you can't, I, I'll sponsor because I believe in her. All kids want is somebody, someone to believe in them. Belief is not just about putting money behind it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can throw money at stuff and go on about your business. What's oh, the real connection? Wisdom, wisdom, time. Time is the most valuable yeah. thing you have. And if someone gives you of their personal time, they're invested in you. And I make sure that I'm available for that.
Well, I was I was thinking as well. The NFL has changed from well, if you look at Major League Baseball used to be called America Sport, and now the NFL has mm-hmm. uh, kind of taken that claim. What what did they do? What how have they captured the hearts and minds? Let me let me rephrase the question. Goodell walks into a facility and gets booed significantly. I mean, like he gets screamed at, yelled at. Meanwhile, the NFL is bigger and badder than it's ever, ever, ever been. It's creating more revenue. It's got more popularity. It's world renowned. It's a huge, huge brand. He gets booed for it, but he's put a lot of things in place um, that are pretty outstanding. So what are your thoughts on the NFL as a brand and how it's kind of captured um, America as the number one sport. We can look at that in in several segments. The commissioner works for the owners. Okay. Almost every guy has a jersey in his closet with somebody's name on the back. The fan base is based on the players, not the ownership. We support and we cheer the players who've done everything they can to be the best in the world at what they do. At management aspect of it, I've been through two strikes, 82 and 87 and participated in the 87 strike, which created free agency for the day's player. So we're talking about labor laws. So a guy at my position, my day, makes 100 grand a year. Same guy makes 18 million 30 years later. That's because of free agency that we didn't have. But as a former player, I'm appreciative because we fought for them to finally get a percentage of the pie they weren't getting. We just wish those players would show more appreciation to the older guys, a lot of who are struggling. Give a little money back to that. Now you don't have five minutes to even talk to because you think you're all that. It's an embarrassing situation. When you talk about the National Football League, they've been caught with their pants down on many occasions. The Ray Rice situation. Mm -hmm. Now a situation with COVID. We're we're still dealing with with the Brady situation. You know, know, I look at all those things. Scandal is not good unless it's in television. It's ratings. Scandal, when you are a brand, when you are a shield, you're a hypocrite. You talk about the brand, but you're allowing the, uh, the inmates to run the asylum. Mm-hmm. So you can't have it both ways. Be honest about what you're doing. There have been more owners who have settled sexual harassment cases in the National Football League. The John Gruden situation mm-hmm. was a caveat to what could be. That's why I mean, the if they open up everyone's emails... What, what, you, what would happen? You have more managers, owners, general managers that are racist than anybody else. They don't want to be exposed. That's why the commission's not releasing that. It, it's what it is. You know, so I tell people, don't, don't be naive. This is an ownership business. You might be a player, but we own you. That's always been a problem that I've had. You don't own me. You're renting me for a period of time. When my service is alone and needed, I'm out. You know, so from that perspective, you might own what I do, but you can't take my heart, my soul, my spirit. That, that leaves with me. You know, and I, and I think with that is in sports, it's all about the bottom line, not about the damage that you do to get to it. And, um, and so I always tell now with student athletes getting paid, that's a problem. I, I really don't agree with that, but that if you are chosen to play a sport, Understand is it's a short shelf life. Prepare yourself for the rest of your life, not for the time you know are going to play. You'll be a lot happier. In that period of time, you're going to have a lot of people coming at you, good and bad, who have bad intentions. And if they're successful, they're going to brag and they're going to try to defame you on social media. I don't worry about what social media says. Social media doesn't know me. If you know me, you're not going to pay attention to that. People who are jealous push send because they don't have a life. The life that you have worked your butt off to earn, you own that. Nobody can ever take that from you. You know, so be happy with who you are and where you're going and who you surround yourself with. The business will always be the business, you know, and uh, you're happy to be a participant, but you, they don't own you. You own your own life. And, um, and I haven't looked back in a, lot of, in a long time. I just try to encourage those who, who can't see what they should be able to see. We've already been there. You should listen to me as opposed to some guy you're paying 3%. He's only interested in your money. I'm interested in making sure you have a life when this is over because we all make mistakes. Now you're able to read the small print that you couldn't read before. And uh, once you sign on a dotted line, can't go back. 
You know, so to me is experience, wisdom, knowledge is priceless that we as former players can offer today's player. But the day's player is so full of themselves because of what being thrown at them. They don't want to listen to anybody, you know, so. So they don't even listen to, to former players? Uh, no. They just listen to their, their PR person, their agent, their, because to their me, lawyer. They, they look at you. You don't have value. You know, I'm making eight million a year. Why would I? I don't need to listen to you. Oh, okay. Yeah, but when you're done, how much of the eight million are you gonna have? And that is a problem. Who is a gentleman from the NBA? He's the richest person that has ever played in sports. He owns like 400 Wendy's. They did a profile. Bridge, oh. Bridge Bridgman. Uh, I know what you're talking about Mitch Bridgman. It'll come to me. Yeah, he played owns for like, three years or four years. Took all of his money, yep. got into Wendy's, and now he owns 400 of yep. them. He is, well, that's like John Elway. He owns every dealership. I think in, Junior, Junior Bridgman. That's the name. I can't remember the guy's interesting story. Yeah. And he did, he wasn't even a star. He was just a your average and and that took is, his money and parlayed it into a path and forward. See, success does not mean you go to the strip club. It just doesn't. That just means trouble. And at the same time, somebody knows you got cash and it got you in the back room roped off in the champagne room and you're throwing down ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. Really? And the camera's on. And now they can blackmail Junior you. No. Junior what? Junior Bridgman yep. played Junior 12 Bridgman. years oh, playing for the memory. Milwaukee Bucks oh, and Los Angeles Clippers. Yeah. One for Dennis. Put that on the board for Dennis. Boom. <laughs> His highest single season salary was 350000 Jeez. He so he made, he made that, just over a million dollars, just over a million dollars in three years, right? He played three years. Is that right? 12-year career. Oh, 12-year career. Okay. Never made. And, and that's Jeez. the thing I'm saying. Unreal. And, and, Five million dollars. And, and with that, just because you make more doesn't mean you spend more. And so many of these guys spend beyond their means. I'm like, I didn't have any money to spend. We had second jobs when I was playing. Mm -hmm. Second. And I'm like, I was never late for a meeting in my entire career because I didn't have to pay one fine. Couldn't afford a fine. I was afraid to walk on. There's no guaranteed money. You know, so, so to me, it's when you're intentionally doing stuff because you have the ability to pay, which a lot of these players have now. That's why you see all the violations and rules. They don't care. We can afford it. Yeah, but a DUI attorney starts mm -hmm. at 10 grand. And you're not going to get off, you know? And so what you have to, to look at, and I tell people, they're in a separate category when you're talking about professional athletes. Don't even have that conversation because you can't really relate to it because that's a, either a crash and burn or it's a success story. There's no middle road. Mm -mm. So Dennis, we had a chance to do a little bit of a tour. You had a chance to hit the guest gong, which we, we, we really liked. But what did you think having a chance to kind of go back and, and take a look at what we do in the warehouse and what we do in production? What were your thoughts on that? I know we had talked about licensing with universities and all those things. It, what were your thoughts just coming out? It just reminded me of when you put all the pieces together, success is inevitable. And I parallel, parallel that to being a rookie, being in the basement, and all the veterans are upstairs at, at Hallis Hall. And what I had to do to earn my spot to get upstairs. And they were a team, we were a team at that point that was not winning at all. We, the Bears actually sucked. And they moved me upstairs. As I'm across from you, here's Peyton. What are the chances you put me across from the franchise? <laughs> the face of the league, I'm a walk-on. Something about destiny. I was supposed to be there. So I talked to him every day and I saw him every day for six years and I had no shoe contract. So at well, that time, Walter had kangaroos mm -hmm. and out of respect, he allowed me to put his kangaroo logos on my shoes. I'm like, what? Okay. The Bears became a, run, uh, a right handed running team because it was about trust. I made my name by blocking before I caught any passes. So Walter only ran towards McKenna, never towards Galt. So whether that's a strong city coming down in a box or outside backer, or aiming on the line of scrimmage. Those are the guys I had to block whenever we had to pull. I was the first line of defense. You went in motion a lot, right? I, I probably ran more in motion than anybody in the history of the Bears. And loved it because it allowed me to be able to head beat. start. <laughs> well, it helped Jim because Jim knows if he's running with Dennis, this man, if he done this, they're going to kick the cover his zone. So you know what a hot read is. The game is pretty simple. But for me, it allowed me to see who I had to block. And I couldn't miss those blocks because a lot of times Walter's behind me. Monday morning, those films, you never did. So respect-wise, we led the league in rushing four consecutive years. Hasn't been duplicated since. 
And I know I had a lot to do with that. We finally had Jimbo Kova go into the hall. The only Hall of Fame of Walter. What an had. amazing speech, by the way. Yeah, I mean, and it's, but we came in together. Yeah. You know, so I, 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 so I go back to that. And then I look at the, the infamous 46 defense. That would have been Hampton, Singletary, Fensick, Otis Wilson. Those are Buddy Ryan's boys before Dent got here. And Durison and Marshall and uh, Mike Richardson and then William Perry. That same 46 on a buddy before I got here in 83 with my guys, they didn't beat anybody until we got the right pieces. Yeah. We didn't start to win. But the 46 got all the credit, but the credit doesn't happen until you get the right pieces. You can scheme till the cows come home. You got to have the horses. Well, you got to have Otis Wilson and Wilbur Marshall. I mean, come on. like. And so I tell people, like, I say, I, I had to practice against those guys every day. So who did I fear on Sunday? Nobody. Because there was nobody better. It made me better to the point where my defense respected me more than Galt because Dennis did all the dirty work and loved it. And so it's how people look at you based on what you do that they can rely on, depend on you, and then they will vouch for you. Yeah. And I think with that, I earned my stripes by hitting guys twice my size, having no fear, and um, everything else came after that. But we were a team that was only known for Walter Payton running left, Walter Payton running right. We were no threat to anybody. There was no toughness on our offense. There was once I got here. That changed us. So we were not just a defensive team. We were an offensive team. And we collectively came together. And we were dominant. And people feared us. That's because you got all the right pieces in place. People who accepted their roles and got tired of losing. That's the same thing in business. It's, you're always recruiting to be better. And someone who basically you put their feet to the fire, they don't sweat. If you know you're good at what you do, nobody can take that from you. You just got to perform. Perform at a high level consistently. Like I said, the results are inevitable. So that is my, I always say my badge of honor. Um, I was not expected to make it because we had golf. Yeah. <laughs> you were the walk on. Yeah. So to me, I had something to prove. I wasn't, I didn't have a guaranteed job. When you're a number one draft, you're guaranteed to be on the team. I got to tell you, something to prove is a powerful thing. That is a powerful thing. When a company has something to prove, when a person has something to prove, when a community has something to prove, man, that is, that is, is the ultimate driver. Yeah. So my motivation was there every single day. I couldn't take a playoff, a day off. Um, I had to work harder, even having veteran players who can tell you exact day they're going to pull a hamstring or a groin injury. Because there, at that time, there was no MRIs. You couldn't do x-rays Verify on the heat spot. So during training camp, these guys would tell me, I'm going to be hurt on Thursday. <laughs> okay, what? <laughs> so I'm looking in the right receiver line. It's only four guys. It's, yeah. like, it's like 12 defensive backs. So I'm running every other right. rep. I mean, it, I got yelled at, cussed at every single day. But I learned all three positions, X, Y, and Z, and I returned kicks. Nobody else could do what I did. So I, was, I made myself irreplaceable. Yes. Well, you held all the punt, re, uh, punt return For records Devin. B before Devin yeah. got there. That yeah. guy, Devin, I tell you what, he... Uh, and we're both from Florida. Can there you, you go. I, I can believe that. <laughs> It's a good place to learn how to run, apparently. The only difference is Devin were running from cops. I was. <laughs> you were running to try and be a cop. Yeah, I mean, so it, it's different uh, type of practice. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but something about being in Florida and California is speed, yeah. you know. And um, but what I was saying to that is, is that you can be bodacious in terms of your presentation about how good you are. But the results say you're you're a losing franchise. Wins don't lie. And we need to find a way to win. We need for you to reach your potential. But you're not going to reach that until we find the other pieces that are going to drive you to be better. And that's what we were able to do. And that's why we had such a dominant stranglehold on our division for so many years. And our guys were so good that they would mass injuries. They never wanted to be seen in training rooms. They felt if they got hurt and got out of the lineup, they would never get back in it because the guy was that good. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, our second team was as good as anybody. Dennis, and I think that's a principle too for business. One of the things that we've injected a discipline here is every functional group has a scoreboard. 
So we can tell the score of who's keeping pace, who's not. And I think one of the things is if you're going to measure your organization, make sure you have the right scorecards. Make sure you're playing the same game together. You know, in so many places that we'll walk into and we're, we're helping companies, the operations team doesn't know what the sales team is striving for. And this, they're in the yeah. same building. Mm-hmm. One, so how do you know one brand and they don't know what collectively what the brand vision is or the brand mission is or who's going to do what or what the messaging is. Across I the always board. say, just because you have a title doesn't mean nobody can't talk to you. Correct. Well, you know everything because you got the title? Really? No, you got a title because you are related to him. Okay, so no, I have to earn my spot. So every chance I get to embarrass you, I will. <laughs> and by the way, and I think it's the responsibility of, if you call yourself a leader of an organization, make sure you're leading. Yes. And just because you hold the seat doesn't mean you're going to hold the seat long term. And, you know, it's, it's being interested. Again, being authentic, being interested, being invested in the teammates that you surround yourself with and choose to surround themselves with you. And I think it's just that whole everybody's accountable thing doesn't matter what you do. We're doing it together. It's yeah. the we instead of the me. And, you know, if you've got that type of environment, I think people work a little bit harder and they want to be there. It's not that they have to. They choose to be there and they, they take pleasure in it. And, and it's the bigger purpose, right? They feel encouraged that they get to have a contributing factor to where the organization is going. And that's fulfilling. Again, that's not a paycheck. It's different than a paycheck. It's a feeling. It's a camaraderie. It's it's a, it's a higher purpose, Um What are you going to be remembered for? It wasn't how much was in your bank account. It's the impact you've made on people's lives. And a lot of times that has nothing to do with money. No, and it's the glowing review that someone says or how their voice changes when they talk about you because it tells about the impact that you had on their life. Man, you know, I can tear up on that stuff all the time. And it's if your presence is always in a room, whether you're there or not, you know you're the man. Yeah. You know, and I think that's it. That's important. I go to awards dinners all the time. I'm more interested in the, those who are accepting awards and the coaches who sit back say, well, I'm proud because that was my student. And if you'd have seen where she or he was a year ago, you never expect them to be here. But I kept pushing them. I had my hand on their show. They knew I was always there if they needed me. That's sometimes all people need is a push and support. That's it. You know, and uh, because if you are getting yelled at in negativism all the time, you don't believe you have any self-worth. So I tell parents, stop yelling at your kid. You need to talk to them. By the way, Dennis, to go back to, I think you've started here. It's the paralysis. If you don't feel you have a voice or you don't feel you have the opportunity to voice your opinion, you're paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you're not making a move. You're never going to make a move. I think that's so right. I think a lot of... um, a lot of boardrooms and meeting rooms and just cultures in general do not facilitate enough discussion. It is, this is your role. Stay in your lane. Mm-hmm. What were the numbers? Outside, what were the numbers? Instead of encouraging their individuals to contribute to the collective brain power in that organization. And, you know, again, if you're threatened by other people in the organization because of title, no title, this, that, and the other, Whose best interests do you actually have at heart? You or the organization? Why wouldn't you want to put your best talent in the right seats to make sure that the organization thrives? I think it's just it's just mindset. And whether it's individual, personal, professional, whatever it is, I think the community aspect of us being more interested in each other as humans is what will get us through all of these situations that are surrounding us. And you know, whether it's social media or not, people just need to get a little bit more interested. And I think that for all of us, I mean, I think I could have set up a 1-800 number during COVID. How many calls I got, people I hadn't even heard from in years who were struggling, didn't know where to go, mm-hmm. were scared to death about what tomorrow was going to bring and the pressure they were dealing with. And as if you have all the answers, but you don't, but you're happy they made the call. Because now I can figure out if I can't help, who I can I call, put you in contact with. Uh, you know, let me get back to you. But I'm thankful for the phone call. I'm glad I have your number because I, you know, I didn't have your number. You know, and it was uh, a time where if somebody trusted you enough to call, if they had nowhere else to go because they felt you had the answer or that you would listen and you would not be judgmental. And that's the most important thing. And it's like, hey man, everybody's story is not your story. And, and so with that, 
it's it's about feeling compelled to share and to talk when you're scared to. And I think that's what abuse does, whether it's verbal or physical. It's abuse it makes you silent. And when I lost Duerson, I still hear the silence. And it breaks my heart because one of my best friends, and he felt that he couldn't talk to me when the demons were at his door. And when you're the same age, same passion, same vision, and you're in a bunk hole together, okay, I've always got your life best. You're always going to be talking to me. So when you have those situations, this is when I learned and I got on board that we're dealing with suicide because you don't know the signs. I needed to get more invested because I didn't want to lose another friend like him, lose another friend like him. And it is frightening when you live a life when you're more concerned about what people think as opposed to what you're dealing with. Dave was more concerned about how people looked at him as opposed to what he was dealing with behind closed doors. I'm like, those people don't matter. I'm your brother. So he wouldn't even deal he wouldn't even deal with or or have those conversations with you because it, of it, it was a trifecta um issue personally in his life with his at that time wife and um a domestic dispute that got him kicked off the Notre Dame board. Mm. And Notre Dame board of director was his lifeline. His mom passed within a few months of that. Number two, he hired his brother to be a CEO of his company who defaulted on their loan. Mm. Number three. So he was dealing with all of that and everything crumbled down on him and having a wife that never worked. Okay. Have a business that you put your heart into. You're the number one supplier of, of uh, breakfast patties around the world is Dorsen Foods in Wisconsin. Your brother, you hire because of your wife wanted to hire him. Okay. You get a $35 million loan. You default on the loan, the first payment. Okay. They, they own your business. And I'm like, Man. are you kidding me? So there were a number of things. He was more concerned about what people thought yeah. than dealing with reality. I'm like, hey, we can fix this. Okay. You know, and so I think about that all the time. And I was never in a lane where there was so much money that I had so many people I had to worry about. Nope. Because those were all the fake people are. Mm-hmm. The real people are in the lane where I am. Because they say, no, I know what Dennis has and what he doesn't have. And he never asked for anything. Nope. Because I lived in my own space. And that's important because. Authentic. When you take on all that responsibility that really you didn't inherit, that's on you. All you got to do is say no. And hell no if they didn't hear you the first time. Hmm. You know, so I, I think when you have loss that is like someone stabs you in your heart, you never forget that feeling. Hmm. And what can we do to change that? So. Every time I watch a game, I think of him when I see those tents on the sideline. Every time I think of Sweetness, who had bile duck cancer, who didn't buy his way to the front of the line because he knew it, mm-hmm. and his lymph nodes got infected, he could no longer be a candidate. The ultimate sacrifice, he was a— Because he, he didn't want to put himself above another human because of what he had achieved in sport. And then think about it. He passes on the women first. All Saints it, Day. Yeah. How? I mean, how—, uh, how, how how do you describe that? I remember the car ride. I remember when it was announced. Grown man in my car, bawling. <laughs> and, and, and so two men who had a tremendous impact on my life that I never, ever forget. And I'm trying to make sure. When I called the mayor's office, said, you know, November 1st is Walter Payton Day. Why are the cities not at half mass? United Way, he was your primary spokesman. Why are you not at half mass? How much money he made you? Because you pass, you don't forget. No one even knew who you were. How quickly people forget mm-hmm. who you are when you are not present. Yeah. So our job is to make sure they never they're never forgotten. That's some powerful stuff, Dennis. Yeah, I mean, so it's it's. Uh, I've seen too many people who who have perished because of what people thought. There was no more money, or they had failing health, or suicide. It's the worst, you know, and. I'm thankful that this is my lottery ticket. I might have had more trauma than anybody in those years I played with the Bears and all those years. And like I came out unscathed, which is almost unheard of. No, this because you took some hits too. I I've had more surgeries and gave some hits, but my brain is 100 percent intact. Awesome. So to me, I can speak for those who can longer speak and tell you these are the things that a game can do for you and take away from you, but. 
the helmet doesn't protect you. When you have that kind of force. It's a car crash. And the helmet moves. The brain moves. The brain is not protected by anything. No. You know, so t- to me, it's inevitable that you're never going to be the same when you, lose this, when you leave this game. And so you have to prepare for that. That's why our are is our union. We still haven't seen our money from our concussion lawsuit. It's been almost a decade. That was just a farce. Every retired player should have a card that they can go to any medical facility as a partner with the National Football League and get health care for the rest of their lives. That's what our union was supposed to fight for. And they didn't. They're only concerned about the current players, which is shameful. Dennis, I, I have a quick question for you because uh, we've touched on a lot today. I have some great notes uh, of things that you've shared that I'm excited to implement in my life. We've talked about business, sacrifice, vulnerability, um, how we protect our women, and all great advice that I think can get passed on to the younger generation. I'm 25 years old going on 26. What advice do you have? How would you define success? And what advice do you have for a young 25 year old like myself, a young 21 year old male for their life that they can implement in their life? Respect your elders, absorb as much knowledge and wisdom as you can from them. Find someone that you look up to that inspires you to be great. Put in the work, never lose your faith. Money should never drive you. As long as you are healthy, there's nothing you can do. You can't do, excuse me. And surround yourself with good people, but surround yourself with people smarter than you. It's important that people want you to be successful. Those are the ones that won't steer you wrong. They'll always got your back. You want people to be on a journey with you who got your back. As you get older in life, you find out who your real friends are. And when you've come to that determination, cut bait with those who aren't. And I tell you what, God will keep you on this urge to continue to do his work. That's wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. I got shoes older than you. <laughs> <laughs> and they're actually a pair of boots I got from when I was in Dallas. I've had them since 1990. I have a pair of ostriches that um, there was a, a boot store with Tony Roma. I went there with Troy Aikman and M.S. Smith. I still have those boots. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> You're a baby. Yes, <laughs> you know, so it, it's, um, man, you played with Emmett Smith and Walter Payton. Only one alive that blocked for both. Wow. You know, and so, like I said, you have no idea the places that you would be. You never thought you would be. That's mm-hmm. God's work. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, um, those experiences, I, I, wow. Sometimes I look back on my life. I was like, this can't be possible. And I'm still here upright, healthy, no debt. Life is good. You know, so, so with that, I tell people, I say, it is all possible if you surround it with the right people, you know, uh, and, you know, learn not to get greedy. Yeah. Well, you talked about repetition before, and I think um, one, of the, one of the things that I'm getting out of this is there's a repetition of giving, right? And the more, the more you give, the better at it you get which causes people to be more confident to call on you, to ask for your help, to be confident, to be vulnerable and say, Hey, I need help. Right. And you've, you've lived a, a life of, of doing that beyond football where you're, you're kind of giving of yourself, giving of yourself, but you also aren't being taken advantage of. And every, I think that that's the key is to find, to be able to give, but to not be taken advantage of. Every son or daughter believe there's bliss amongst their parents. If you find out, that there is abuse. As a son, you feel like you didn't protect your mom. And then you do everything so that never happens again. So everything that I do on that front is because of my mom. My dad apologized to me when my mom passed for all past transgressions. It took me a while to accept him back into my life. But in life, there's always forgiveness. We are taught that in our spiritual life. Forgiveness. Otherwise, my mom can't rest. She would, she would not feel right if I didn't forgive my dad. Mm-hmm. So I went through that process. And it's so when I hear stories of women who are living the good life, but it's an abusive life. I'm like, so let me get how low did you how low did you raise lower the bar? That you're bought and you're still being abused. You have a lot more to offer than that. 
I'm like, he should be doing jail time or he should be getting a beat down, one of the two. Mm-hmm. You know, and, um, and I say, so you're protecting the lifestyle as opposed to your life. What's more important to you? So you don't get to come and cry on my shoulder when you have the power to change everything. So don't talk about it, be about it. And those are the things that you have to do. And so I try to tell all these young women today, stop flaunting yourself out there like you're for sale. You should have more pride and more commitment to yourself of who you are and what you, what you, what you deserve. You are always going to be a queen. Anybody who treats you differently cannot be your king. I heard a great speaker on that who essentially said, if, if you were given $10 million today, right, just given $10 million today, but you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, would you take the $10 million? And just about every person goes, absolutely not. Why would I take $10 million today if I'm going to die tomorrow? I can't spend it. In other words, what you're saying then is life is more valuable than money. So for all those women or all those people that are being abused or putting money first or putting persona first or whatever it might be, Life is superior to anything that you could get financially or material, material wise, right? Um, you just got to put that, you got to put that first. But it's so hard for folks to, to see that in this society that we live in. We are conditioned to worship certain things. We see that through our smartphone, through our computer, through our TV. Because we're sitting there in obedience, okay? It's a cult, you have to break away from that. Sometimes that's why we, we take vacation. We go to the islands and uh, we have some herbs and spices, you know. <laughs> and uh, we, we cooking. Know, we dis- cooking. <laughs> cooking. We cooking. We disconnect Baking. from the world for a while. Mm. Because sometimes if you don't get away from it all, you don't realize what you're missing. It's the simple things in life. As long as I have the ability to get up and pay my bills, I'm going to enjoy myself. That's it. Pay your bills so Uncle Sam doesn't be knocking on your door. Find some people that you can help. Go donate, laugh. Donate your time. Visit hospitals. Help some senior citizens. You know, talk to some wounded veterans. Find purpose in your life. You know, that, that's what it's all about. I'm still above ground. I don't need any assistance. I can go talk to anybody. I can go inspire. You know, and that is the DNA I was raised on by my parents in terms of the spiritual side of it. And to me, that's my calling now. I have... Retired my athletic shoes. Them days are over. Now I'm about teaching. There's way too much knowledge in my head not to teach. You know, and young men, especially before they are, they develop bad habits. I need them early. And that allows me to put the parents on the side. Mm -hmm. Let me teach. That's why you called me. Mm -hmm. So you trust me. I said, I know what to do. Because I'm not the one who punishes them. That's you. But they were talking to me because they look at me as an ally, not a threat. So we need to work in partnership. I will tell you what you need to know because I have their trust. And I'm not going to break that trust by telling you something and it comes back on me. No. Kids will always open up when there is no threat. But I tell all parents, when you have teenagers, believe me, they do lie. Everybody says, it's not my child. Yes, your son lies too. Your daughter lies just like everybody else. <laughs> you just got to be smart enough to know when they are. Well, it's, yeah. by the way, it's communication. Because then the more they talk, the more you figure out real quickly if they're telling you the, the truth or if they're telling you the story. And then it's hard to keep a story straight. Yeah, invite all the stuff. friends over. Everybody who they have, invite them uh, over. 100%. Have, have a party. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You'll see things right away. Uh, yeah. Do you find out how good they got it? Yep. See, so like I said... Open book, open heart, never be judgmental, compliment, not criticize, you know, and understand that you were young once too. Yep. Dennis, give me your greatest memory, your greatest memory of your NFL career. Greatest memory, uh, obviously winning Super Bowl. I understand that, but give me something that's within that, w- within that game, a play. There's only one play. All right, let's hear it. New Orleans. January 19, 20, you know, 1986, January 26, introduction for the Super Bowl. And I'm introduced, you know, introducing the starting lineup. Mm-hmm. And mom's sitting up in the stands with my brother. You know, you know, her baby has made it. And he's not participating. He's starting. He's starting. Okay, he has an impact on mm-hmm. this team. And she was there to witness. And she was my number one supporter, cheerleader my entire life. 
And it's to me, when I didn't get drafted, I was going to quit. I live a three hour and away from the University of Miami. She said, you have been the best at every level. Don't let somebody behind a chair with a microphone or a gray sheet say that you're not good enough. You're going to train and, and, go to, to, and go to these training camps, which is what I did. And the Bears were the third, third training camp, camp uh, team that I visited with the Jets. Um, is this Washington. pre-combine? Did they have a combine There's yet? no combine. Yeah. And uh, so she convinced me not to give up on my dreams. And I tried out and, and made the Bears. So that journey would have never happened without her. So to have gotten to that point, and then she's up and you know up in the stand. That's the greatest moment. Yeah. She will say, "When I graduated from college, first in my family to do so," and she was there. But that, knowing that that was what I did since I was nine years old, was my my gift to her. He said, "Without you, I wouldn't be here." That's powerful. Oh, good stuff. I mean, sometimes we we have short term memory of those who we need to thank that never gave up on us. You know, so I tell people, I said, I have nothing to be upset about. I smile because she smiles with me because I am, everything you see here mm-hmm. is mom. Well, now you're pushing people. You're teaching people not to give up Paying on themselves. Forward. So that memory never stopped. It, you're just creating more memories for yeah. additional people Pay based on the same principles. Remember now, mom drove a bus. So I'm always paying it forward. We yeah, ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, absolutely. Well, Dennis McKinnon, Silky D, I would imagine that that these stories are in this book here, this beautiful book for the camera. Silky D bears all Dennis McKinnon with Chet Kopic. If you don't know who Chet Kopic is around the country, he is a Chicago sports legend, right? I mean, this he, is an unbelievable sports he, writer. Tell me what that was like. We have been friends for decades and we going back to AM 1000 in Chicago. And we always talked about having a show together and a podcast. And that never materialized. And I was um, we talked about doing my book. We wrote that book in 28 weeks, 28 consecutive weeks. We, we met for lunch to write the story. And uh, he was having a, an issue at family. His daughter was getting married. He said he needed to take a break. He was going to say, I'm going to go for about a week and I'm going to come back. He never came back. Hmm. And so I was left with a manuscript, no publisher, so I had to uh, have to self-publish uh, with Amazon. I had to find some people to uh, finish everything. And so I dedicated the book to him. That's why his picture's on the back. We were the best of friends. And I'm a, this book is his last offering. We had talked about the tour we were going to do together locally and international because yeah. he was tied to WWE and WWF. He knew all the wrestlers around the world. Like, oh, this is going to be so cool. <laughs> you know, and so it's it's – with regret that I'm not on tour with him, but he speaks volumes because if you get a chance, it's a good read. And it's my life story in a lot of ways. And, you know, the picture that's on the front, those are the real shoulder pads. Yeah, it's the real pads. Right? And see how small they are. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So those and you are played outlawed. at 183 pounds, yeah. 183 pounds in the NFL and going over the middle. Hello. And, uh, and so I tell people that, I was the best block in football for years and I was so good. I had death threats. That's when you know, you have arrived, yep. <laughs> you know, and, um, and my greatest hit was on Lawrence Taylor. We call that a decleter where you hit him. And the first thing that hits the ground is his shoulder pad. Is that a chip block? Oh, I was you, a crack, it was you, a crack. Oh, it was a crack back. Oh, you know, and, uh, and so every time LT sees it, yeah, man, you can hear it on the sideline. And the next play, LT lines up towards me, not even looking at the quarterback. <laughs> he was coming to get you. No way that guy hit me. That little guy over there? Yeah. <laughs> and so I had no fear. And, but that was my, my claim to fame. I think all my teammates would say that is that he gave us uh, an identity offense we didn't have. But I have the best block, job blocking for sweetness. Doesn't get any better than that. You know, and it, it's uh, – so once again, I lost Dave, I lost Walter, and I lost Chet. You know, and it, it's – it's uh, but I am still here. And every day I go, I talk about those three. Um, and – but sometimes you don't know the pain that they were in that it was time. God called them home. Yeah. Walter was in a lot of pain. Dave was in a lot of pain emotionally and, and mentally. And Chet physically was in a pain. He had back surgery. He couldn't stand straight up. He had both knee surgery. He was in so much pain. 
So sometimes we don't ask the right questions, but we don't have to because it's God. Yeah. You know, and uh, and so with that, it's uh, hard not to talk about them and smile because they gave me tremendous joy. Well, you're honoring them. I I've recall uh, my father said a Thanksgiving prayer. Thanksgiving's coming up. He said a Thanksgiving prayer, gosh, probably when I was 15, 16 years old. And at 16 years old, you know, you're just waiting for the food to come out. And you're probably not paying attention, but. He said, and and we kind of giggled at this because it was it was so heartfelt, but it it was almost uncomfortable. He said, "Honor the dead as if they're living, and the living as if they're dead." And that has been a real powerful message for me to treat people that are right in front, honor them as if they could be gone any moment. And the people that are gone, talk about them, talk about them always, and honor them. And tell their story, and I think that you're doing that, and I think that's it's fantastic. And as we are approach Thanksgiving, all you ladies out there, learn how to cook a dish. <laughs> okay, don't go to a grocery store <laughs> or the Baker Square and pick up a pie. Get a deep fried turkey if you haven't had one. Mm-hmm. If you want to impress your in laws, make a dish from scratch. Deep fried is fantastic. Ooh, deep fried is peanut fantastic. Peanut oil. Oh, mm. by the way, the secret to deep fried, if you guys want it, because it took me a couple of years to get this right, brine the turkey 24 yeah, yeah. hours before you deep fry it. Get a cooler, salt, yeah. oh, cranberries. Yeah. Put Soak it in a bucket. Just let it sit there. Let it drain. Make sure the water's out of it, because if you drop that in hot oil, you're going to have a fire, and then you're going to have a fire. You're going to have an explosion. But deep fry, there's, by the way, a close second is air fry. Yes, so the, I have I have a ninja at home. Oh, they've got the the big ones, Charbro. Yeah. Another plug for Charbro. There you go. <laughs> Has the air fried one. You just put it in there, and it's got like just propane, mm-hmm. no oil involved. Super crispy, beautiful. It's we're gonna smoke one at our managers meeting. It's gonna be a beautiful thing. It's coming up. Soon. We have a managers meeting. We 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 rent a house for three days. Oh yeah, I'm also, so so I I normally do Thanksgiving dinner on menu. So I call him and say, what are you having for your menu? Determine whether I'm coming or not. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, your time's valuable. You got to make sure you're getting the most out of it. <laughs> if I want to listen to a whole lot of chatter mm-hmm. yeah. for the women in the kitchen, because the guys are here by the TV watching mm, the game. Absolutely. Or somebody trying to set me up with somebody, I need to have some good food. <laughs> <laughs> so, People are trying to set you up at Thanksgiving. Abs- I mean, it never fails. Come on, is it because of the nickname? No, because he's available. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that, that's the problem. And you debt know. free. And debt free. <laughs> debt free. They, but I'll cut. I'll, we will edit that part so that they're not knocking that your door down. Wait yeah, a minute. But, he's debt free. Yeah, man. But Dennis, let me tell you what. Dennis loves food. My mom cooked for the team. Really? There's a. There's a. There's a. You know, we we back in the day when it was the uh, uh, the Great Sombrero in Tampa. The five years that mom cooked for the team, we never lost. Her and her girlfriends would rent two vans. They would cook and prep two days in advance. They would drive up. And I had enough cachet with Tampa at that time that the owner would give me a pass to give the mom so they can park right next to the buses. And they would load that and we take that to the plane. And so my teammates, especially William Perry, they would give me all the money in advance to send down. We, you know, William wanted a German chocolate cake. He wanted a... Um, he wanted sweet potato pie. Uh, he wanted peach cobbler. You know, we had the greens and the chicken. And, and that was just William. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so I, I think I have a, a, a game ball that was presented, presented by the Bears to my mom. But I look back at those times, I'm like, man, if you trust us enough that we can have soul food, yeah. we ain't gonna lose. You know, so I provided food for the team. And then for a couple of years, I provided all the Louis Vuitton. I had a contact in Miami, so we would have. So a you there. started the trend. And you see bears coming down on the plane. Mm-hmm. They all got Louis Vuitton. They're all wearing them. Then it's hooked there. I was a, yeah, I was a pusher back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> pushing Louis. I, I had it going on. I mean, it, that was like a little little side hustle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so, I mean, why not? The things that you do, and there was a place in in Joaquin called Lakehurst Mall. Mm-hmm. There was a shop yep. I used to go in. They had tights. We're in the Midwest. It's freezing. I'm from Florida. I had to get used to coats. So I would buy tights to wear in practice. Well, uh, one day Walter got my tights. Wouldn't give them back. So I had to buy tights for everybody. 
So during a lot of those days, we didn't have an indoor facility. We practiced outside, so we have tights underneath the pants. So yeah, Dennis was a supplier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All the, the little the things. Cat, that, the girl at the register is like, how many girlfriends you have, sir? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's 52 of them. But, it, it, but once again, it, it was the connection that you had with your teammates. Yeah. That they relied on you, they trusted you, and there was just a relationship. We did everything together. You know, that's what I see that's missing today is guys go their own separate ways. So when you don't spend every time. Very siloed. You, you don't know what issues they're dealing with. I need to know the wife. I need to know the children. I need to know the birthdays and anniversaries. So that way I know if something's off yeah. or if the if wife says there's a problem, she feels free to call me. You know, you know I, that's the thing about communication, loyalty and trust. That's what a real team is, you know, and uh, stay on point, period. So that you never surprised when you had an opportunity to do something about it. That being said, I've taken up too much of your time. No. It's, it's impossible. Awesome. We could talk. This has been absolutely fantastic. Dennis can't thank you enough. I, I will tell one last story if you don't mind. Um, just real quick, like I said to everyone earlier, um, in 1985, I was 10 years old. There was two people that I was in the backyard. I was Walter Payton when I was running the ball. Walter Payton lived down the street from us in Arlington Heights. He used to trick or treat at his house every day. And, or every Halloween, excuse me. He got mad that I showed up every day. So I would just go on Halloween, but I would trick or treat there and he would reach in with that big claw on Walter's hands now. I mean, if you ever saw him carry the football, right? He ran with one hand. His hands were about that long. He reached in there and he grabbed out dum-dums. He always had dum-dum lollipops. I don't know why he always had, but that was his thing. He grabbed it in there and he, he always made you shake his hand. Mm -hmm. Always made you shake his hand first. And as an eight-year-old I'm going, I'm looking at my hero, right? And he's making him, he's making me shake his hand. And I was always Dennis McKinnon when I was wide receiver. My older brother, seven years older than me, would throw me passes over the middle. We had this little rubber Chicago Bears football with the, or, the orange stripes. And he would always throw me down and out to so throw me uh, five yard cuts over the middle. And I was always Dennis McKinnon. So this has been a real honor for me uh, to be able to meet you and, and I, I would tell you that um, this has been a lot more fulfilling um, than I think I could get across to you. The insight that you've been able to provide and the knowledge, the expertise, the wisdom and the kindness that you've shown to come out and do this. We really appreciate it very much. So I've I can't always, thank you enough. I've always been welcomed. Um, you know, that's, maybe that's the thing about this state that I've lived in for so long that I've always felt welcomed, that I deserve a seat at the table. And um Unconditional love. And I think that when I talk, it is, there's nothing fake about it. It's all about passion and it's about life experience and about a commitment to making the world better. And, you know, two people I have to have a shout out to Dr. Kababa, who I want to say that we're ready to go back to St. Charles to deal with our young men incarcerated so we can prepare them for life on the outside when they get out that we got their bag. And to my, my you know, big ups to my friend up in Flower Mound, Texas, the big deal um, she always wants me to mention her name. Um, she looks out for me, trying to make a difference in the world. And I've had so many great people that I still think about, have lost, that are still with us. And we still all have the same mission, to make the world a better place. Because I think we lost track of that during COVID. We started attacking each other. Not a way to live. Mm -hmm. Can't do anything about politics because they got their own agenda. Yeah. Um, and they've forgotten about the people. The people that you're supposed to serve doesn't matter what nationality you may be or what party you're tied to. We're all taxpayers. So if we're struggling, we're all going to struggle together, you know, and I don't worry about people making a change in my life. I have to make a change in my own life and be happy with that. Well, I truly believe when we talk about this team success is when a group of individuals decide that they're going to be great as individuals within the confines of the team. Yes. And when you look at our country as a whole, if we would all just decide to have a little bit more individual success, then the overall team success would come together. And that's when we'll really thrive as a country, as a mankind, as a society. Um, and then it'll really become a, a pretty powerful thing and maybe we'll win some championships together. And by the way, one of the things I wanted to add, very famous phrase, divide and conquer. Yeah. I think that's huh. exactly what they did. Divided us all and they're conquering. It's time we unite and conquer the other way. And I think it's just getting people to talk more. I'm a big fan of 30 Seconds of Courage. You don't know what you don't know until have a conversation. 
you may be surprised that we're not that far off from, you know, the experiences. And I think that's the part that hopefully what comes out of all this is that people start to re-engage. You know, I had another thing during COVID, connect to stay connected, Mm -hmm. right? You you take it for granted. Oh, that's a friend of mine. When was the last time you saw him? Six months. Why? That's not a friend. Nope. That's a memory. (laughs) That's the way I look at it, unless you start to engage people. So hopefully what comes out of this is a desire and a passion to reconnect with the people that have been in our circles and, you know, those circles will change through life, but just make sure you always have a circle and you're part of circles and you, you take, you take your role, you take responsibility for your role. It's not just about what they could do for you, but what can you do for them in their circle and stay active in that circle. Absolutely. And everybody opinion matters. And just because you're loud doesn't mean you're right. Correct. Closing thought. Closing thought. Let me think about that for a moment. Inspire. As we're all looking around the corner, never be surprised at what you see because we've been waiting on you. Your destination is already predetermined. You just have the patience in getting there and having faith that it's what you're supposed to have. And I think that we are so focused on so many things that are not really that important. If you're not healthy, it's going to be a painful journey. Take care of your body first. Mentally, surround yourself with people who love you unconditionally, who will pray with you when you need to be prayed with. You know, find something that you can have an impact on and commit to that. A lot of times that's volunteering or, or mentoring or being a life coach or at the same time, just being someone to listen. It takes a tremendous amount of talent to learn how to listen. You know, and I think with that, um, you always have the power to get up every morning to make a difference. What I try to do every day. Well, you made a difference today to Dennis, and, and we can't thank you enough. Hit it, G. Dennis, you've been in the club, powered by Club Colors. Cannot thank you enough. Chris Tossi, thank you so much Happy for be here, being on. It's been an absolute pleasure. You made a little boy's dream come true, Dennis. Thank you so much. We're going to go out in the parking lot, throw down an ounce. I'm going to run the patterns. I've been stretching all morning. It's going to be beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> That's a total lie. I'm going to pull a hamstring. Hey, by the way, if you don't know who Club Colors is, please follow us on all of our social media handles. My God. Smash the subscription button on our YouTube channel. You got to watch Silky D, Dennis McKinnon. Please go out and buy his book, Silky D Bears All. Dennis McKinnon with Check Copic. This has been In the Club, powered by Club Colors. Keep watching us. We on the move, baby.